Okay, so Professor Hayes, to get started, um, how would you describe yourself to someone that you're meeting for the first time, someone that doesn't doesn't know you? Well, usually what people mean by that is, is what do you do? You know, what is your role in life? And you know, I'm a clinical psychologist who spent my life trying to figure out how language and cognition works. So I do a lot of basic research on you could say the human mind, but it's what are we doing right now? I mean, it's, it's really what is symbolic thinking. And then I've tried to take what I've learned there and apply it to places that make a difference in human beings' lives, especially around human suffering, but also human prosperity. And uh, putting into psychotherapy, that was probably what I'm best known for, but uh, we worked hard at putting it in other places and uh, social transformation and uh, education and places where, uh, you know, people can use knowledge. So I'm a kind of a, a geek who has spent his life trying to be useful to people. That's, I, I'd probably say that. If you said it another way, I'm, I, I'm an old dude with uh, four kids uh, who are spaced in such a way that I have children in the home for, uh, you know, 40 years as a uh, uh, more than that, actually, uh, when this last little guy is sent to college. So uh, I like the th the things that children do, and I'm, I've spent my life trying to be a, a loving father and a good person. But uh, it's a lot harder to evaluate yourself as a whole human being. And uh, whenever I start saying words like that, I feel as though, nah, you know, probably not better not to say those sentences. They're only half true. 100%. Um, so I'd love to ask, you know, what sparked your initial interest in psychology? And when did you know you're, you were going to become a clinical psychologist? It was really early on, you know, in part because I, I thought the kind of stuff that people write novels about and poems about and do films about, you know, that's so important. And yet, I said, you know, I, I was, this is in high school. Uh, you know, as editor of the newspaper, and the, the literary magazine, blah, blah, blah. In college, I was editor of the literary magazine. But I was also uh, good at science. And I thought, you know, really the most progressive thing that humans ever come up with is science. Mm -hmm. And if you if you take Shakespeare in a modern playwright, which one's better? Well, you'd have a hard time deciding, right? Take a physicist today versus 50 years ago and say, which one's better? In terms of the actual content of what they're saying, it's unquestionable. I mean, just a, an ordinary routine physicist today is light years better than just 50 years ago, never mind 100, 200. So we've come up with something really cool, but how do we square the circle of bringing science over into what really makes a difference in human beings' lives? And I, by, you know, then I was reading things like, um, uh, Abraham Maslow and on um, peak experiences and stuff like that. And I thought we have to create some sort of science way of sort of being better at raising our kids and having families and being happy and achieving. And at the time I wasn't so focused on anxiety, depression and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, as a high school student, I, I said, you know, the, the one field I can think of that does both those things is psychology, which turned out to be absolutely right, really kind of miraculous that uh, I fell on it and I, I never wear it, wavered from it. And uh, I've been trying to square that circle of how do we bring human complexity into view and using really good quality bottom up uh, uh, evidence to, to do that. Yeah. And um, that's guided the rest of my life, really. Fantastic. So you're the founder of Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. And what I find really interesting about your story, Stephen, is that you seem to reject the status of guru. Like you seem to, you really, uh, you don't, you don't like that. And you developed act in a way that it's non-hierarchical. And I'm just curious, you know, what sort of gave you this approach and why have you gone down that path as opposed to what many other schools of psychology have done? Yeah, well, part of this comes out of my experiences of the 60s and watching all these gurus fall over one after the other. You know, I, 
I, I lived for a while in a religious uh, commune run, run by a disciple of Paramahansa Yogananda, uh, a, a 60s thing. Steve Jobs liked him, but uh, uh, one of his uh, uh, sort of renegade uh, disciples named Kriyananda was running this commune, Ananda Farm. And this is just an example of the, it was rampant in the 60s. So I'm living on Ananda Farm, which is cool. I really love communes. I wish that I could live on one right now if, it, if you give me one that was nuts. But, um, you know, I'm sitting in the, the group communal living thing and a very attractive young person over there starts weeping about how she's led the master astray. And a silence comes into the room. And this little voice several tables over said, I thought I left the master astray. <laughs> and another one said, I thought I led the master astray. I mean, it's just, you know, make it stop. You know, everywhere I looked, I mean, the Fritz Pearls of the world, etc. You just go up. My goodness, you know, um, Roshu, uh, Joshu Sasaki Roshi, the first person to ever expose me to Zen thinking in 19... What was that? Golly, late 60s, early 70s. When he first just got off the boat from Japan. Go wiki, Joshu Sasaki. You know, one of the major leaders of a major wing of Zen thinking. He's a hundred years old and his acolytes are complaining about his, how he's hitting on them. So enough with the freaking gurus. You know, let well, the cool thing about science is you put something into evidence-based stuff. If you really have principles that matter, it doesn't matter if you're a mass murderer. You know, if those principles are dialed in and, and the science is honest and it replicates and can be used, it's there for the human community for the rest of creation. Mm. And so when you move it over into the human ego and how great and grand you are, and create hierarchies, uh, you know, then you have to visit, pull these things down or you're left with this horrible thing where it's happened in psychotherapies and stuff where everyone who comes up with some idea that gets a lot of people interested in it, not even for the rest of their life, but for multiple lives thereafter, people are sort of wondering what the master would have thought. You know, you can go to societies now and find out what did Carl Jung think? How the hell do we know what he thinks? He, he's worm food. You know, he wrote what he wrote and he's done. You know, so could we put something into human culture that's progressive? And I'm back to that insight as a, as a high school student. So I got very frustrated with what I saw in the 60s and it turned out everybody had clay feet and uh, I saw it several times and, and came into the work with ACT really dedicated to the idea if we're going to open up the human heart and we're going to try to move it you're touching things where people it's so important to people that they will easily give you guru status and you you really don't want that you have to protect it so like an act it isn't just that we have a you know a rap against it you cannot certify therapists we won't allow you to do it because as soon as you're giving an anointing guess who's at the top of the hierarchy? The founder. Even when you said the founder, I flinched a little bit. I do allow people to say that I originated, but then I want the word something like and co-developed. Because okay. yeah, it's, it's like I lit a match and a little fire started and then a whole bunch of people brought logs on and became a big bonfire. I can't go dancing around saying I made the bonfire. <laughs> it's, it's bull. I didn't. I just lit a match. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I instigated it, but a whole community has co-developed it. And we've put things in our association and so forth where we prevent the creation of uh, hierarchies that we then would have to dismantle. So, for example, yeah, we do have a procedure where we'll recognize trainers, not line clinicians, but it's done like a grant review. And one of the things you sign on is a value statement at the end. It's free. Uh, the people who are evaluating you are you're creating competitors for themselves. They do it as a voluntary action. 
because they get why it's important. And the thing that you sign says that you won't make proprietary claims. You give away your protocols for free or low cost. You let people know about your innovations. And we've already thrown people off the recognized trainers list when they've tried to say, come and learn my special form of act, which is really wonderful and better than other people and you all certify you. <laughs> Go do that somewhere else. You wanna do it, do it, it's free world. And so we put in things in our culture to pre prevent human frailty from grabbing us because the conceptualized self, it's right in the act model, ego, if you want to talk that way, is there and it's seductive, man. It's If you don't know that it's seductive, uh, just look a little harder. And the, the better you do, the more seductive it is. So uh, let's put those... Uh, barriers there between the science that's there to serve the interests of others and fame and money and all that kind of other kind of stuff which is fine i want people to do well i want people to succeed financially but i don't want it to be this grabby clinging after immortality that uh, is really what's underneath it we're all going to die we're all going to be forgotten but if you can put something into the human culture that makes a difference in people's lives and that is evidence-based, even though they won't know that you did it, that will echo on and human community will benefit from it. So that's uh, the game. I think it's really powerful and it's, it's so refreshing in this world. There's, a, there's another guy you've just reminded me of in the UK. Well, he's actually Irish. He's called Blind Boy and he's a comedian, but he speaks a lot around mental health. And when he's on stage, he just wears like a brown paper bag over his head. So nobody, <laughs> nobody in the world knows who he is. He's completely anonymous, but he's got like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of followers online, you know? So he's not Brilliant. doing any agenda. He's just doing it because he wants to put the information out there. So I think there's a lot more power behind it because of that. But what I'd love to get into now, Professor A, is yeah. to the foundational ideas that ACT is built upon, like things sure. like relational frame theory and things like that. So... Could you maybe have a go at explaining that to the relational frame theory? Here, let's see if I can do it in the simplest way that I can. It developed and co-developed with ACT. So it wasn't developed first, and then ACT happened. They co-developed the very first article that where where you can see where ACT is coming even before it's named. Walks through some of the RFT uh, relational frame theory ideas, and I'll just give you a little taste of it, and then say where it kind of leads to. We've spent 300 years trying to figure out how the human mind works. And we've often either said, well, it, it works like a computer or, or somehow the brain does it, or in the psychology side, it works by association. And then the, the brain association one comes together in modern uh, kind of cognitive uh, neuroscience ideas. And really what that I, idea is, is it's kind of like a metaphor. Be like if you had chalk on this hand and you rubbed it on that hand, that it, you, you would, you would ha then have chalk here. Mm. So all association does is it says by, by time or place or similarity, both these hands look similar. Um, what you learn in one place goes to another place, right? Because they occurred together. They look similar. They touched each other in time and space, Okay. You've been trying to make this dog work to figure out how the human mind works and it just doesn't work. It's just lousy at it. And if it did work like that and you had, for example, thoughts that were unhelpful, you might be able to say, boy, how to keep that thought away from something else. Like, uh, It'd be kind of like if, uh, well, COVID is, you know, a coronavirus kind of thing. If someone walks in the room and shook someone's hand and then left and you said, and then they run in an hour later saying he had, he had a disease, you know, who did he touch? We could find all the people who he touched or the people who he touched to who touched someone else, right? Yeah. Well, thinking that way, if you have thoughts you don't like, find out the ones that you don't like and figure out a way to get them, figure out a way to get them out of the, room right and trace down just like track and trace and covid you know the ones who might be infected right what if it's not like that uh i think it's more like this that we learn to relate things bi-directionally we create two-way streets have different kinds 
The first one that comes in is just a name. 12 month old babies, if they know that this is, uh, when you see this, it's called Coke. If I say, where's the Coke? The baby will try to find the Coke. Language trained chimps don't do that. So-called language trained. And don't tell me about your dog or cat. I know your dog or cat is smart, but no non-human animal reliably does that. Your 12 month old baby does it. And once they do that, they start learning another way. They hear a name that they don't know what it means. They look around and they find an unfamiliar object. They then assume the unfamiliar object is named that. And when they were presented with the unfamiliar object, they can say the name. Okay, so here's the rule. You learn it in one direction, you derive it in two, and then you put it in networks that change what you do. That's a little ditty of RFT. Well, here's the importance of it. Picture uh, something where relation matters, not association. Picture a family, maybe a family gathering where people come in, uh, all the people who are named Smith get together or whatever, and you've got like 200 people, they're all related, okay? Mm -hmm. One person comes in just like that example where if the guy comes in and shakes a hand, one person comes in who you don't know, but you know all the other 200 and you say, who's that person? And you say, well, that's Bessie's second cousin because he is the son of, and then names the relation, right? How many relations just changed of all those people? It's thousands just changed. If you do the math on it, if you had eight words linked to eight objects in eight different ways, you can derive about 4,000 relations. Okay, so how many things are in your head that you could derive a relation to? Well, you say, well, I don't connect everything. Yes, you will. Give me a, uh, I'm going to look around and I'm going to pick an object. Now look around and pick an object on your desk. Tell me what it is. Pen. Anything. A pen. Okay, so I'm going to pick a relation. Uh, is the father of. Okay, here's what I had in my hand. Glasses. How is the pen the father of glasses? The person that invented glasses uh, wrote the idea then with a pen. Yeah. And when you finish, isn't that real? I mean, it's, it isn't. You didn't make it up. It's defined by the objects, right? Mm. The pen really could be used to write down what it would take, right? You may have even drew a picture and, and maybe the refraction of the lens and the light, right? It really is. It really is the father of this, right? Yeah. Well, wait a minute. Here's the problem. In the RFD book, we, and I've done this with thousands of people, any word, not just an object, but a noun, a verb, etc. with any relation will relate to any other word. When you're finished, it'll seem apt. It'll seem like it's in the thing. Okay. Mm. Either everything relates to everything else in all possible ways, because God so arranged the world that way, or this is an illusion of mind. I think it's an illusion of mind. And if it, and think about what it means. If eight gives you 4,000, how many things are in your head that you could relate one to the other? Infinite. Hundreds of thousands of things, hundreds of thousands. And if you drive the relations, it's infinite. I've actually tried to do the math on this and you end up with answers that are like, there's more possible relations than molecules in the known universe. All right. Now I'm a clinical psychologist. I don't just care about raising people's IQs or teaching them blank. I care about that. But I came into it also caring about human prosperity and human misery. And here's the problem. If you can relate anything to anything else that's in your head in any possible way, how are you going to rein that thing in in such a way that if you have a thought you don't like, you have an image. Some of these things you came by honestly. You saw horrific things. You were said, you were, horrific things were said to you. People have told you that you're not lovable, that you're not smart, that they don't want to be around you, or you've done things that are shameful or guilt producing, or you've seen horror, you've seen tragedies, or people close to you have died. The people, you, you with me on this? Yep. How are you going to keep those things from relating to everything else? 
Well, what the mind will do is say this, I know what I should do, I'll suppress it, I'll push it out. Just I'll solve it like I would with the COVID guy. You know, I'll just keep him from shaking hands with anybody. Okay, so you're looking at a panic disordered person in recovery. This is where ACT comes from. This is where RFT comes from. You know, I'm a behavioral person doing my work, next thing you know, I'm, I have a panic attack in a apartment meeting, then I'm doing all the logical, reasonable, sensible, pathological things you do to avoid more panic because panic means you can't function. In the actual meeting where it happened, I raised my hand to say something. By the time they called on me, I couldn't make sound come out of my mouth. And then I publicly humiliated myself. Turns out I know some of the faculty who were there and they didn't really notice it. They thought I was just acting weird. But from the inside out, it was like a catastrophe. But my, my point being, when you start trying to push things out, if everything relates to everything else in all possible ways, because you have a mind that, that is a relational engine, not an associative engine, uh, then when I try to think of not thinking of something, I've just created more ease in thinking of the thing I'm trying not to think of. Because mm -hmm. I've, I've now related some, so I, if I saw something like, uh, I'll give you an ex uh, example that actually happened to me in my uh, panic journey, where I was doing relaxation tapes to fight the, the anxiety because you know, I'm a CBT behavioral therapy, a behavior therapy person, it wasn't before CBT really, a behavior therapy person and relaxation is supposed to help with anxiety, right? So I'm thinking, oh, it's better and I'm relaxed. I'm not anxious. So oh, it's better. That's better. And, it, and I'm in a situation where it would be bad to be anxious because I might not be able to function. Like this situation, if I stop functioning and you, your recording is <laughs> that, you're not going to be too happy. I'm not going to be too happy, right? So I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I, I, I'm glad I'm feeling relaxed. Those tapes really help because, you know, relax is, is better, than, better than, what was, did, did my heart just skip to be relaxed? Is it, how, how far away is the door? Relaxed, and I had a panic attack. Why? Because I'm thinking about relaxation. That doesn't make logical sense, but it makes psychological sense. If I say to you just this word, hot, what comes to mind? Cold. Cold. <laughs> Relaxed. Anxious. Anxious, exactly. So where are you going to go that your mind's not going to follow if even the opposite can remind you? You know, when, when somebody tells you how wonderful and loving you are, you might want to run away. Maybe it means that uh, you're going to be betrayed. If you opened up to that, think about how hard it would be. What if you actually let that person into your life? And then they betrayed you. Or what if they're lying? What if they'll die? You see the problem? Mm -hmm. So, if you think of languages relating, you can do wonderful things. You can train kids who don't speak how to speak. You can give them the sense of self. If they don't have it, you can raise their IQ. There's really good data coming out of the RFT labs of how powerful an idea that is. And as a clinical psychologist, it's a shit show. Excuse me, I probably shouldn't be on. It's fine. Because it now means... You know, we've got within this wonderful ability that allows us to imagine futures that have never been and to create things that have never existed and to, you know, because anything can relate to anything else. You can think imaginary universes and what does n-dimensional space look like? And isn't that cool? Yeah, but you can also think what would happen if right here I suddenly had a panic attack? What would happen if this person who I love so much betrayed me? Mm. So, so it seems that we can't change these networks. We can't add thoughts to them that are going to, are going to improve them. We can't. We certainly can't unlearn things as well. You know, we can't take anything out. Oh, you can add things to them. You just don't know how that'll work. Yeah, um, I mean, you could add things to them, but it could go. It's, you know, it could go in all kinds of directions. You win a million dollars, suddenly you're now paranoid about people taking stuff from you. I mean, 
you don't know how it's going to land. But yeah, you can add things to it. We're doing it right now. Okay, fair enough. But what I'm trying to get from the, the mental health point of view and, and this sort of solution, and it is the solution that we need to change our relationship with these networks and we need to become is a more flexible um, yeah, is that is, is that the what you we're cheated getting your red and liberated mind? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that learn it in one, drive it in two. It's a two-way street. Association doesn't work. Backward conditioning is very weak, as you probably know. In classical conditioning, you're a psych one one class. Drive it in two, put it in networks that change what you do. If if when you try to change a network, you actually are adding to the network in unpredictable ways. So when you do logical, reasonable, sensible things, it could be logical, reasonable, sensible, and pathological. Like don't think of something as logical, but it, it creates more focus on the thing you're not trying to think of. It's paradoxical. That's how the mind works. Well, given that, messing around with this spider web that's almost infinitely large is a fool's errand. You'll never clean it up. You hate racism. You hate it because you got freaking racist strokes in your head. And they're they're doing their dirty work while you're asleep. You don't even control what they do. You've got like a spider weaving that web continuously. But what you can do is change what they do. So if you look at where what we've done as language and cognition has really rolled in, and we know even in the written history of humankind, because things changed with writing, we have a little bit of a picture of that. The major religions start showing up right about that time. Why? What's inside them? Always what's inside them is some sort of mystic or somebody trying to rein in some of the excesses of language, whether it's a koan or chanting or repeated prayer or silence, meditation, something. And we're not going to solve it with just religion because that turns into dogma and religious wars. You know, we do the same dirty work with that that we do. But inside our wisdom traditions, our methods that we can research, put into the normal life, put it in the factory floor. I, I don't know if it's 10 day silent retreats. That's cool if you can do it. But we can put things into the factory floor that you can do in 30 seconds. And so if, if we can hack how the mind works, then what we can do is work on how we change what they do. So you have a thought, but with a little bit of separation. You have an emotion, but with a greater openness. You have a memory, but it's there with many other things. You feel an urge, but there's many things you could do with it. So you try to open the door to behavioral choices to the to the way you allocate your attention or what you do with your moments in life and allow it to be guided by something that isn't just the, the kind of automatic eliminative knee-jerk response to thoughts feelings memories bodily sensations to the world within and instead is focused more on the qualities of being and doing that you want to put into your life on your values so if you can learn to rein in the human mind, put it on a leash, use it when it's useful, notice its products, don't fight it, don't push it away. It's got lots of inter interesting and entertaining things to tell you, some of which are useful, some of which are not. Well, let's back up just enough not to diminish, but to see that process, take what's useful, leave the rest. And when you do that, you don't eliminate things. You start diminishing them the same way you would if I gave you a glass of salty water and said, I command that you drink it. You're not going to get out tweezers and pull out the salt crystals. But if, if there's a, you know, a nice gallon jug of fresh water around, pour it in there and have a drink. And a little bit of salt is actually kind of nice in water. And in fact, distilled water tastes lousy. So... You know, a little bit of spice of pain and of loss and of betrayal is good for you. It'll soften you. It'll help you be less judgmental of others. And what I, you know, I say to my clients sometimes is, okay, you want to get rid of anxiety? You really want, okay, I'll, I'll make you a devil's bargain. I'll get rid of it. But here's the deal. Two things. One, 
when your children come to you and talk about being afraid, you'll have no idea what they're talking about. And number two, the things that you're afraid of, when you flip them over and you see that some of that is the places you care, when we eliminate the fear, we've got to eliminate the other side. So if you're afraid of being betrayed because of the vulnerability that comes from love, I'm sorry, but we have to eliminate love too. Because it only comes just like a sheet of paper. It only comes with two sides. And if, if you don't know that love opens you up to vulnerability, then dude, you don't know what love is. I don't know what you're talking about if you don't know that. And so you want to eliminate the possible negative side of things. You have to eliminate all the positive things that they're linked to and the compassion that comes from knowing what it's like to be a human being. So I've never had a client want to take me on that devil's bargain. They want the one-sided sheet of paper and they want the emotions being eliminated without ignorance. No, doesn't come that way. So we better learn a wiser way. And frankly, our philosophers and our wisdom teachers and so forth have been saying this forever. I mean, this, the act stuff, you dig into the psychological flexibility processes and you end up kind of sitting in the same field with monks. You know, I mean, you're in the same territory that uh, has been written about for thousands of years. The only difference is, is that science can do it without woo-woo and maybe without guru <laughs> to go back to. So no woo woo, no guru, uh, let's, but, but respect for the human condition and the wisdom that's there from uh, our culture that uh, needs to be put through a scientific filter. Definitely, definitely. Um, one of the most, one of the lines from the book that grabbed me the most was, I think it was, it's not what you think or feel that counts. It's how you relate to what you think or feel. That's what counts. You know, and that, I heard that and just went, whoa, that's, that's powerful. Um, so the next thing I'd like to talk about, Professor Hayes, is psychological flexibility. You know, what is this? And how can people start, how can people know how psychologically flexible they are and then how they can begin developing psychological flexibility skills, if that's possible? Well, you mentioned the liberated mind, and it does walk through a lot about the evidence of it and what it is. And um, on stephenchayes.com, you can go and free and get my flexibility scores. You can take some flexibility tests, you know, self reports. But I kind of, I think really the bottom line is the the life you're living. How you know is because you are growing in your ability to move towards what you deeply care about without getting in your own way. But in terms of what those skills are, you know, it's a constellation of six things that can be summarized in three pillars, but really it's one thing. So it's six that are three that are one empirically that looks like that. I'll say it in the three version, three-step version. You need to learn to be more open to your thoughts and feelings, more present here consciously and we're able to allocate your attention towards what you deeply care about and to build habits around it. So open, aware, and actively engaged. That's the pillars. In what I just said, there's six features. I mean, one is, if we've already talked about it, taken the analytic, judgmental, categorical, comparative uh, mind, these relational frames and networks that allow us to predict, evaluate, and compare and take those things that normally show up here when you think something that's so close that you don't even notice you're thinking, you just notice the thought, or as another metaphor, it's like you're looking at the world structured by the thought and put it out there so that you can see the thought. That's called diffusion, it's a made up word. Fusion comes from a Latin word, means to pour something together. It's kind of like what we're trying to do is take lemonade and sort of separate it out into lemons, water, and sugar. So that with a little bit of separation, not to dissociate or distance, but just to get perspective, you can see a thought as a thought and you can watch your mind form it. Now I'm having this thought. Cool, that's not your enemy. And it's not your dictator, it's not your boss, you're not married to it. You don't have to do what it says. 
it's just grist for the mill, right? And then the same thing with your felt sense, emotion, bodily sensations, to be more open to that. We use the word acceptance. It can mean kind of tolerance and resignation. We don't mean that. We mean it the way that's still in English when I say, if I have something precious and I say, here, will you accept this? And you give this to somebody. You don't mean, will you tolerate my gift? It means, will you willingly take it? And so what we work on is how people can willingly take in their own experiences. Not as what they say they are, that's this part, but as what you experience them to be. So when you have a memory, let's say of a past abuse, yes, it's painful. Yes, it's painful. But your openness to that memory will prevent you from being abused in the future. It will empower you to step forward and maybe do something about abuse. Maybe you join a group or to, you know, write a Me Too column or to, you know, be there for others. You, you with me on this? Well, so that's a gift, isn't it? 100%. It's a painful gift, but it's a gift. And so diffusion and acceptance are the opening up parts. Being able to come into the present means to catch that there's this witnessing, noticing, I hear now part of you that was built out by language from that moment where the social primates were the ones who actually have this response in the eyes that allow us to do it. When your mama got up in front of you and said, oh, you sweet baby, and looked into your eyes when you were brand new, you dumped endorphins like, woohoo! You know, your brain started flooding itself with natural opiates to just be in the presence of kind eyes, yeah? Mm -hmm. Because social primates need to know what's going on around them and to be part of the group. And we even have, we're the only ones with whites that allow that to see where mama's looking, even not just where mama's head is. And so connecting with this witnessing self of I hear now I'm aware, that is built out, it starts without language, but is built on by language with perspective taking. What do I have? What do you have? What do I have now? What, would, what did you have yesterday? People in Bangladesh don't have any food. People, you know, I hope in the future we don't have global warming. You know, time, place, and person are these perspective taking skills that allow us to take just awareness and in our mind move it around. And we can imagine what it would, might be like to be our great-grandchildren uh, with the waters three, four feet higher than they are now. And there is no Venice. It's things you can swim down to if you put on your, your aqua lungs. You know, we can imagine that world. Uh, and we can say, no, I don't want that kind of world. And then that's that last piece. What are, your, what are your values? What are the things that you would like to put in your behavior as qualities of being and doing? The adverbs and adjectives. And how would you build habits around that? And so I, those are the six things. I can give you a way to, as, as a guide for this, um, one of my favorite ways is to ask somebody to pick somebody who powerfully lifted them up. Could I do that as a little exercise so people know what I'm talking about? Yeah, of course. If, if, if you just think of somebody who powerfully lifted you up in your life, who in some domain, some area where things are of importance, man, they were there for you. They were a guide. They, they, you know, their impact on your life was really important. Somebody you actually know, somebody you spent time with, not just somebody you read about. Yeah? So here's the questions. When you're, you were with them, did you feel accepted for who you really are? Did yeah. you feel as though you're being constantly judged or was judgment somehow kind of off to the side? When they're present with you, were they present with you or were they looking at their watch, you know? And when you looked at them, could you see that there was a conscious human being there where they kind of really, or did they treat you like an object? Did what you matter about 
what you cared about matter to them or would they override what you wanted, what you cared about? Would they violate your values without a second thought? When you were together, could you be together in ways that fit the opportunities of the situation? Or is it only always one way, my way determined by them? You know, my guess is you felt accepted, you weren't judged, they were present, they were conscious. What you cared about mattered and you could be together in ways that fit the opportunities of the situation. Those are the six flexibility processes. So if you wanna know what psychological flexibility is, Think about the people who really lifted you up and they're modeling it for you. They're showing it in their relationship with you. And so you know about psychological flexibility. When you read about it, you go like, oh, I mean, it feels like familiar. It's kind of like old home week, but the mind doesn't get it because the mind wants you to be Guy Grand or polypathetic who's gonna come into the group because you know, you're, you're gonna earn your belonging by specialness. The mind wants to have everything in its place and to know everything. It wants to be able to get rid of all things that are bad, bring in only things that are good. I mean, it just walks you through these anti-flexibility processes of being closed instead of open, judgmental instead of diffused, allocating your attention to what the danger is, ruminating, worrying, buying into your stories of who you are. And then in the area of values, grabbing on to what we started about, guru dem or money and building habits around that instead of around what you deeply yearn for. Uh, that's a toxic brew and it's what we're promoting in the culture. It's we're promoting in commercial culture and we're reaping the wind. I mean, people your age, your young men, uh, are standard deviation more likely to be stressed, depression, depressed, or anxious uh, than people who are your age in my generation. So that's our gift to you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> this is a culture. I mean, some of it came honestly. I mean, this is pretty cool. Mm. Yeah, but it, you can see anything horrible anywhere on the planet within minutes. You can see a constant flow of comparison. You want to see what rich people have with gold-plated doorknobs, you know, you can see it. And a constant flow of judgment. So you can see people's Instagram pages where everything looks wonderful and then you compare it to your insides and it doesn't look like that. And if you go on your newscasts, you can hear about how Trump is an idiot or how uh, Obama was a criminal. I mean, so we've got pain, comparison, and judgment as a steady diet. That's, that's about as toxic as you can get. And um, if we don't help our young people and ourselves at all ages, uh, you know, get modern minds for this modern world is going to overwhelm us, I think. Big time, big time. Well, Stephen, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Um, just before you go, um, where can people find you online? Where would you like to send people that are that are watching this interview? Well, they can go to stephenchayes.com if they want to find out about me particularly. But if you just Google Acceptance and Commitment Therapy or ACT, You'll find a lot of free resources, for one thing. You're going to find a lot of uh, groups on, on Facebook and other things like that. Or uh, there's one I send people to, Act for the Public, at groups.io, a free listserv. So you, if you have problems you're wanting to solve and you're doing self-help kinds of things, there's a vast amount of self-help resources that are out there if you're suffering in a particular way. We've done randomized trials of these things. They will lift people up. I mean, a liberated mind and get out of your mind into your life. My first trade book. I haven't done the randomized trials with a liberated mind, but I had it with get out of your mind. And it's about two thirds of what you get from a course of psychotherapy and it costs 12 bucks. You do have to read it and you have to actually do the exercises. So don't just put it under your pillow. It's not magic fairy dust, but yeah, I would encourage people, if there's something in here that I've said that's resonant, to 
look at what's out there and to think about how we might use our own psychological flexibility and personal growth to help soften the culture and to put tools into people's hands that will help them when uh, they're being exposed to a diet of pain, comparison, and judgment, and uh, need to find a place of, that allows peace of mind and purpose. And that's what really the ACT work is about. How do we get there uh, using evidence and science as the guide and not uh, just gurus and good thoughts that are filled with other things that may not be really that helpful and may frankly be about, you know, wanting people to be part of their little kingdom or whatever. So uh, that's how they find out with me, but also how they can find out more importantly with the resources that are out there with the, the work that we've done over the last 40 years. Okay. Well, um, Stephen, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for sharing some of your wisdom with us. I really appreciate it. And yeah, I guess we'll speak soon. It's been awesome talking to you and thanks for uh, giving me some questions to show that if you've become aware of the, the work and uh, took the time to do that, uh, that's an honorable thing. Thank you for that part.